My name is Gerald Lerman and I'm a clinical professor of anesthesiology at the John R. Oshai Children's Hospital and uh, clinical professor at Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences here in Buffalo, New York. And this is the third lecture in this series uh, discussing the pharmacology, uh, pharmacokinetics of inhaled agents and other aspects of uh, pediatric anesthesia. <clears throat> in this next module we're going to review uh, what is known about retinopathy of prematurity, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and introduce some developmental pharmacokinetics. Now let's begin with retinopathy of prematurity. The problem that emerged uh, with the uh, develop, administration of high concentrations of oxygen to premature infants. We know that the <clears throat> incidence of retinopathy of prematurity increases in very small babies, and that is in those under 1,250 grams, we see about 68% of all forms, mild, moderate, and severe, are retinopathy. Um, about 37% have more severe form of retinopathy. <clears throat> the incidence is almost 90% for babies who are born at less than 27 uh, weeks and decreases down to 14% in those who are more than 32 weeks gestation at the time of birth. It remains a major cause of worldwide blindness. Retinopathy of prematurity has been the single most important cause of blindness. Um, with increasing survival of younger and younger infants leading to much more immature retina at the time of birth and the risk of the retinopathy of prematurity. The two counterbalancing uh, winds were, are preventing retinopathy of prematurity by limiting the exposure to excess oxygen versus the risk of increased mortality from lower oxygen concentrations. Now in the normal retinal development, we know that angiogenesis is stimulated by the physiologic hypoxia of the developing retina. When the metabolic demands of the maturing neural retina outpace the oxygen supplied by the choroid and the encroaching retinal vascular network, vasoactive factors are secreted by the avascular retina. This stimulates vessel formation and is part and parcel with the sequelae of the retinopathy of prematurity phenomena that we have witnessed. Vasculogenesis of the retina begins over the 12 to 21 weeks gestation. Angiogenesis begins at about 17 weeks starting at the optic disc and radiating outwards, completing the event by term. But interruption of the delivery and removal of the, I mean, interruption of the gestation and removing the fetus from the uterus prematurely leads to a very serious series of problems. And these are related to the understanding now the pathophysiology of retinopathy of prematurity. The first is the oxygen concentration and that is the in utero the oxygen exposure is very low. The PO2 is very low in the fetus and simply giving birth exposes the child to PO2 levels that surge in excess of 100 millimeters of mercury which is a relative hyperoxic insult and in the very premature baby may cause a reflex cessation in growth of the retinal vessels. This is known as part one of the retinopathy of prematurity. And the magnitude, the duration, severity, and the fluctuations that occur depend on the oxygen concentration a child's exposed to and how old they are, how many weeks gestation at birth. We know Vascular endothelial growth factor is critical to neovascularization, but it is suppressed in the presence of hyperoxia. Hyperoxia, as we said, even 
by being born into room air or in the operating room if we give excess oxygen. And pruning microvascular changes um, that occur and even apoptosis may be dependent or may depend on this VEGF. As well, insulin-like growth factor, which is only available in utero, primarily playing a major role in retinal, uh, retinal vessel growth towards the end of gestation, optimizes this VEGF, uh, but with premature delivery, the infant is cut off of this insulin-like growth factor, which leads to an interruption in the normal retinal vascular growth. Hemoglobin F, uh, which has the same oxygen content as the adult, but at 8% reduced saturation and stress, all of these may be contributing factors to the pathophysiology of retinopathy and prematurity. The retinal vasculature is very sensitive to hyperoxia. As I mentioned the, uh, earlier that the PO2 in the baby may be as in the range of 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury, but surges even in room air at birth, not including the added exposure of oxygen, as was the case in premature babies when incubators were first introduced and high concentrations of oxygen were pumped into the incubators and there was a, an enormous epidemic of retinopathy of prematurity. This hyperoxia downregulates hypoxia-induced factor which regulates growth factors such as VEGF and erythropoietin. And as I mentioned, IGF-1 levels fall once the baby is delivered and is out of uterus. So all of these factors together cause arrest of the normal vascular development of the retinal vessels, which leads to the phase one or beginning of retinopathy of prematurity. Phase two begins at a later stage, more than 32 weeks gestation. Once we have the initial phase one of retinopathy of prematurity, we see a transition occurs as the metabolic rate of the retina increases and the vasculature cannot supply sufficient oxygen and nutrients to the developing retina. Hypoxia-inducing factors, I mean hypoxia-inducing factor one, induces factors that lead to aberrant vessel formation at the junction where the retinal vessels have arrested or were um, terminated and the rest of the retina. And these, interestingly enough, these new vessels that emerge actually don't feed nutrients into the retina, but they actually, the neovascularization actually permeates into the vitreous. For some reason, these new blood vessels do not adhere to the normal pattern of being in the retina, and then that leads to a retinal detachment which if severe enough, involving enough of the retina, leads to blindness. So retinopathy of prematurity has been classified in terms of the zone or the region where the um, ROP occurs and the stages or severity. Zone one is vascularization within the circle in the center of the optic nerve, and we'll see this on the next slide. Uh, zone 2, a little beyond that, and zone 3, extending beyond all of that. The stages do determine how severe this angiogenesis and resulting changes in the vasculature of the retina affect vision because the retina in the serious stages of 4 and 5 becomes detached, which causes loss of vision. And we can see on this slide, we see um, the right eye and the left eye, and we can see zone one is immediately around the optic nerve and macula, zone two, a majority of the rest of the surface area, and zone three just at the perimeter. And 
using the clock hours, we can define um, the area of the retina that's involved um, and determine exactly where any retinal detachment may be occurring, unilaterally or bilaterally. The risk factors for retinopathy of prematurity are shown here on this slide. They include low birth weight, low gestational age, and supplemental oxygen. The earlier the delivery, the younger the fetus that's born, the more likely the child is to develop retinopathy of prematurity. In other words, retinopathy of prematurity is a rare complication of infants being born at greater than 32 weeks or of a larger size, more than 1,500 grams. The administration of oxygen remains a risk factor, but also associated with frequent apneas, sepsis, causing a systemic inflammatory response, positive pressure ventilation, and anemia. And lastly, hyperglycemia has been associated in some studies with the development of risk factors for ROP. But suffice it to say, in very low birth weight infants, there's very little indication to maintain a saturation greater than 85% under any conditions. And in a number of the studies looking at factors that predispose to retinopathy of prematurity, they tend to come back to the same list of factors shown here on this slide. Low birth weight, oxygen exposure, mechanical ventilation, blood transfusion, intraventricular hemorrhage, sepsis, and vitamin E deficiency seem to all interplay to, uh, when ROP uh, is present. But the pathophysiology has expanded beyond this focus on oxygen. Uh, suffice it to say, high concentrations of oxygen are not in the patient's best interest to minimize the risk of ROP. But as well, we know that genetics do play a role and that there are six single nucleotide polymorphisms and six genes that are associated with ROP. Furthermore, the systemic inflammatory responses associating with um, high levels of some cytokines um, and uh, uh, other factors in the um, inflammatory cascade may be predisposing the child to ROP. But none of these have been identified, isolated, and I, um, treat, used for treatments in terms of blocking the cytokine responses successfully. So we see now that retinopathy of prematurity has a far broader list of causation and associations than just oxygen as was originally um, uh, concerned. The phase one refers to the sudden arrest of the vascular growth in the first few weeks of life in the premature infant. The phase two is the secondary abnormal vessel growth and fibrous tissue that occurs as the child is older in the 30 to 32 week postmenstrual age period. And anesthetics during these periods may affect the course of the disease. And that is exposing the child to excess oxygen may either cause the vascular arrest early on or promote um, impaired responses later on. Although oxygen tension by itself is not the only cause of ROP, increasing oxygen tension may increase the vascular endothelial growth factor, which will lead to the uh, tortuous vessels growing off the retina and into the choroidal tissue uh, and ultimately leading to a phase four or worse retinopathy of prematurity. And certainly management of the oxygen tension, to keeping it to a minimum, may reduce the need for lasers a treatment to reattach the retina. So the treatment currently for retinopathy of prematurity includes adequate nutrition, specifically in the form of insulin growth factor and uh, fatty acids that are present in the placenta donated by the mother um, that are these polyunsaturated fatty acids, if given in a supplementary manner along with IGF, may attenuate 
the severity of the retinopathy of prematurity. Monitoring oxygen saturation, minimizing the fluctuations in oxygen level have gone a long way to attenuating the problem of uh, ROP. And uh, once we're into the secondary phase of ROP, antivascular endothelial growth factors injected into the vitreous have shown some salutary effects. Erythropoietin as well, and then laser use for detached retinas in the uh, avascular retina has been um, uh, shown to be salutary. In order to understand the patient's staging of ROP, we need multiple examinations and treatments that may require anesthesia or sedation uh, for these children. Uh, during any procedures, the oxygen tension should be closely monitored, um, but even after uh, or up to 44 weeks gestation, the levels should be kept to the minimum in order to maintain some saturation range generally between 91 and 94 percent. Um, extremely low birth weight infants, however, may tolerate a wider range of saturation because this is disease doesn't always conform to the uh, mean values and there is a great deal of indi individual variability. In the next part of the lecture, we'll review some of the aspects of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And we'll begin with a question. In terms of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, A, the incidence is inversely correlated with the gestational age. B, primarily presents with airway obstruction and in school-aged children and adolescents. C, language delay and cognitive impairment are more common in low birth weight, extremely low birth weight infants with BPD compared with those without BPD. D is all of the above, and E is none of the above. And the answer is all of the first three are true. So let's look at some of the current concepts in bronchopulmonary dysplasia. It is the most common cause of chronic lung disease in infancy. The original description of bronchopulmonary dysplasia by Pathway, no, North, Northway some 50 years ago has now been replaced by a less severe new form of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. We can say for sure that bronchopulmonary dysplasia is infrequent in infants more than 30 weeks gestational age and more than 1,200 grams in weight. In virtually all of the cases of bronchopulmonary dysplasia now appear in infants less than 1,250 grams at birth, with half of them occurring in infants less than 750 grams. This slide shows you a chest x-ray of a child with bronchopulmonary dysplasia and this ground glass appearance of the lungs. Now for the most part you know, we can see here that uh, prematurity uh, whether weight or weeks um, is a nonspecific factor that predisposes to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And the causes of chronic lung disease and bronchopulmonary dysplasia um, uh, are shown here. Chronic lung diseases first shown uh, in occurring in premature babies uh, or term babies um, where the definition of bronch bronchopulmonary dysplasia is the old-fashioned one um, where uh, hyperoxia and overventilation, over distension of the lungs were primarily responsible for the disease unless there is an associated uh, disorder, congenital anomaly like congenital heart disease or diaphragmatic hernia. Currently, the definition of BPD is that the baby remains oxygen dependent 
beyond 28 postnatal days. <clears throat> and that's actually not completely correct because we grade the babies at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. For the infants who are born less than 32 weeks, <clears throat> they will depend, need oxygen for the first four weeks. And depending on how much oxygen they need, we will define them as having mild, moderate, or severe BPD. For the babies who are born at beyond 32 weeks, we really are focusing on oxygen dependency any time after the first eight weeks or 56 days. Uh, again, mild, moderate, or severe. So um, depending on the FiO2 required in order to maintain the saturation greater than 85%. <clears throat> so we treat or define bronchopulmonary dysplasia in terms of a gestational age of birth and then whether they're one or two months old and how much oxygen they need to maintain the saturation greater than 85%. <clears throat> Even though the babies are born a very low birth weight and they begin to grow, they are ex-premature babies and it is crucial to appreciate that their pulmonary dysfunction, while very severe and tenuous in their early life, does not completely resolve as the baby grows, even into the 10-year age range. That is, there is evidence of chronic lung disease. Originally, the original definition of bronchopulmonary dysplasia is distinct from that we have today. Because in old days, before we had surfactant, there was severe epithelial injury, fibrosis, smooth muscle, hyperplasia, resulting from overinflation and distension with other lung areas of atelectasis when oxygen and high concentration was given and the lungs were beaten badly by mechanical ventilation. Nowadays, this is a very rare occurrence. We deal more with a new chronic lung disease where we see it occurring primarily, as we said, in the very premature babies with negligible evidence of epithelial lesions. The alveoli are not destroyed and overdistended, but rather there are fewer and larger alveoli. There's variable fibrosis, usually less, and developmental arrest uh, is less common. Gentle ventilation, more CPAP and passive ventilation or non-invasive ventilation is the order of the day. And the supplementary use of surfactant in these young children combined with low oxygen has led to a much softer or milder form of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And we can see how these factors all interplay when we look at the susceptibility to the stages of lung development and antenatal exposure to insults like steroids, chronic amnio chorioamnionitis and intragrowth uterine growth restriction, uh, and a genetic susceptibility to arrest of um, the um, uh, lungs and developing this new bronchopulmonary dysplasia, something that is mild. In the past, we saw the old bronchopulmonary dysplasia where we had ventilator-induced injury in patients who were exposed to oxidative stresses, whether it's sepsis or uh, from uh, other causes, infections, uh, postnatal steroids as opposed to antenatal steroids, um, and fluid overload and nutritional deficiency. And so this kind of picture is far less common today. But bronchopulmonary dysplasia is not just a disease of the alveolus. We have to think about it in terms of the marriage of the ventilation in the alveoli and the perfusion on the pulmonary vascular side. Um, and pulmonary hypertension contributes to some of the morbidity and mortality associated with bronchopulmonary dysplasia with a substantial mortality two years after the diagnosis. The vascular growth 
changes throughout development, beginning with the embryonic period and extending in the postnatal period, both alveoli and arterioles. And depending on the patient's preeclampsia, uh, intrauterine growth retardation, or preeclampsia on the maternal side, we can predispose the patient to developing bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Whether these interact and change the signaling triggers for VEGF, nitric oxide, and endothelin-1 um, will depend on the individual baby, uh, but they may all interplay to predispose to bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So by way of example to show how important it is to appreciate that a child who has survived the early birth and had bronchopulmonary dysplasia but is now mature, relatively free of disease. But when one studies the FEV1, the forced expired vital uh, tidal volume after a pre percent of a predicted value, we can see in the controls lying within the blue box, but the survivors of bronchopulmonary dysplasia lag behind with much lower FEV1 values, substantially lower, from six years up to 20 years into adulthood. So the disease, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, is not just a disease of prematurity, but it is a disease of childhood and young adulthood and depending on the severity of the BPD early on, this may continue through into adulthood. And we see here some more evidence um, that data showing that in the um, young infants that they have air trapping and decreased FEV1 and FEV, uh, FEF 25 to 75% versus controls. Uh, 18 to 19 years later, very low birth weight infants, lung function is variable, reflecting air flow in the lower, very low birth weight infants, and worse in BPD than no BPD. So there's ample evidence to show that all of the indices of pulmonary function testing are abnormal. And in the injured lung, as we see here, with some basal inflammatory mediated induced signaling, the inflammatory response on top of a viral infection may be far different than the response to a viral infection in a normal lung. Additive, synergistic, but we do have to pay attention to the child who presents with a history of premature birth, BPD, and now has an infection, and whether or not we want to proceed with anesthesia, because we may find that the child develops far more complex emergence and post-operative course necessitating ICU admission and intubation than we expected. BPD does not just affect the lungs, but evidence suggests that they are far more likely to develop a number of cognitive dysfunctions, including language uh, delay um, and cerebral palsy. Um, and uh, this will carry through into childhood. Once again, our ground glass picture of the chest x-ray in a child with BPD. <clears throat> Beyond the early infancy period, the child may suffer with chronic cough and wheezing, needing bronchodilator therapy chronically, having airway obstruction, hyperinflation of the lung, and hyperresponsiveness, whether it's putting an endotracheal tube into the lung or doing a bronchoscopy, we may find that the child has hyperreactive airways. Chronic lung disease progresses to the premature baby without chronic lung disease and ultimately to the term child in question is, do they ever become normal? <clears throat> there are other issues associated with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, including neurologic abnormalities um, and chron uh, chronic gastroesophageal reflux due to incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter, hiatal hernia repair, um, and uh, part of that in the background of a neurologically abnormal child. So we have a number of systemic factors that can affect the 
uh, BPD, that BPD affects the child and their development, but external factors, including paternal smoking, uh, may be associated with adverse respiratory events in kids with URIs, um, placing an endotracheal tube versus an LMA versus a mask, a history of reactive airway disease, uh, maintenance with an inhalational agent that uh, irritates the airways, uh, and so when one evaluates the child with BPD for an anesthetic, we have to look at the entire constellation of pictures and weigh the risks and benefits of proceeding and which technique to use and whether the child has been optimized uh, from a pharmacologic point of view, a medical point of view, an antibiotic point of view before proceeding with the anesthetic. Prematurity always remains a critical factor in this evaluation. And once again, symptomatic infants, we need to be cautious on assessment of the airway and how we're going to ventilate them, if at all, uh, treating the bronchospasm um, and whether or not they need an ICU admission post-op. And that's of paramount importance because one cannot always predict exactly the outcome. Even in the asymptomatic infant who appears to have overcome all the complications of bronchopulmonary dysplasia, bronchospasm, a respiratory infection may create scenario that requires close care for the immediate post-operative period. Now let's look at some developmental pharmacokinetics. Drug metabolism and biotransformation change radically in the first year or two of life in the baby. Hydrophilic drugs tend to be excreted via the kidney. Lipophilic drugs tend to be metabolized in the liver before they are excreted. The primary hepatic enzyme system that we are most familiar with and know the terms about are the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. P referring to the red pigment and absorbing light at 450 nanometers. There are two types of reactions that occur. The first are the phase one reactions that hydroxylate, for example, the compounds, and the phase two, which are those that conjugate and excrete or make them water soluble to excrete by the kidney. In terms of the phase one reactions, the cytochromes one, two, and three are then subdivided according to the letters and numbers in which they were discovered. Variation in the genetics by single amino acid substitutions called single nucleotide polymorphisms and non-genetic variations or epigenetic um, malnutrition and developmental um, effects may superimpose to lead to um, differences in uh, gene activity. Some drug clearances may vary by maturation of the enzyme such as metabolism, uh, midazolam and the 3A4 enzyme system. Now in the liver Phase one metabolism is primarily mediated by the cytochrome system. For example, cytochrome 3A4 happens to be one isozyme that is responsible for about 50% of the drug metabolism, the, of the drugs that we uh, administer to the patient. Cytochrome 2D6 is only responsible for 20%, but it itself has probably the most polymorphisms of any of these isozymes. And the remainder are shown here at the bottom. And you can see cytochrome 2E1, that enzyme responsible for degradation of inhaled agents and the release of inorganic fluoride, certainly in the kidney, as a notable factor. The cytochrome P450 enzymes are hypofunction at birth. And you can see in the first 24 hours of life, all of the enzymes shown here are about 15% or less of the adult values. In the case of 2D6, which is responsible for about 20% of the drugs and most of the drugs that we administer and most of the opioids, specifically codeine, that, drug, that enzyme increases very slowly, only reaching adult levels uh, by about uh, 10 to 15 years of age. Um, 2E1, the isozyme responsible for inhalational agent metabolism, similar slow rise in activity. 3A4, 
rises fairly smartly at 50% of adult values by one year of age, and it is responsible for about half of the drugs that we administer and has very few polymorphisms. The phase two reactions are responsible for the el water-soluble elimination of many of these compounds in terms of conjugation, either by glucuronidation, sulfation, or otherwise. And those follow the UGT pathway. Uh, it has a heterogeneous maturation because many UGT enzymes um, really don't exceed the adult value activity levels by uh, at three months of age by more than 25%. Uh, so uh, these may mature slowly, uh, but uh, otherwise um, are responsible for the in ensuring that our metabolized drugs become water soluble so they can be excreted by the kidneys. And with that, we draw the conclusion to this third session on um, the fetal circulation, uh, transition circulation, and um, uh, uh, developmental pharmacokinetics. Thank you.